welcome you're watching India Today, India Tomorrow, the program that interviews families across generations, giving you a chance to peek into their lives, find out about their stories and share in their magic. And today I have for you a unique father and son combination, poet, politician, lawyer, Kapil Sibyl and his son Akhil, who's an outstanding lawyer in his own right. Welcome to the program, Kapil and Akhil. Let's start with you, Kapil. Four years ago, you told Caravan magazine, and I'm quoting, I hated school, loathed homework, right. and was the black sheep in my family. Without any my doubt. mother often said, what do I do with this kid? I have to say, this almost makes you seem like a normal human being. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. You know, my, my brothers are very bright in academics. I was okay, uh, you know, not on top of the class ever. Is he being modest or is he being truthful? It's a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. It's a, and in college, it was a little different. But in school, I, I, basically, I was out in the field every day playing cricket. You know, I was the hockey captain, football captain, cricket captain of my school, best athlete of my so school. So all your skills were athletic, all. not cerebral? Not at all. Not the great lawyer I wasn't born. I hated maths. I hated working. And my mother used to say, what are we going to do with this kid? You know, you had three elder brothers and an elder sister, so I take it you were the baby of the yes, family. Exactly. Were you a spoiled brat? No, no, they used to bully me. They used to bully me all the time. And you let them get away with it? I let them get away with it. I, I, you know, I was too small to retaliate, quite frankly. <laughs> now, Akin, you had an amazingly diverse education. You began with a Hindi medium school in Delhi, three years in Egypt, high school in Paris, college in America, and finally a law degree at Cambridge. Now, that's either a great education or a very confusing one. Which was it? <laughs> Bit of both. I mean, of course, you get a lot of exposure. Uh, so that part of it is very enriching. It can be a little unsettling because you're shifting every three years, going to a new place. So there's an adjustment period. And obviously, in your younger years, uh, you're less able to adapt. Um, so it, it takes a little getting used to. But overall, in hindsight, Definitely a, a very positive experience and it really stretches your mind, expands your horizons and uh, enriches you as an individual. Now you made your first mark, not as a lawyer but as an actor when you were at St. Stephen's College. You acted in Shakespeare plays like Richard III and Julius Caesar. They gave you a nickname at the time. <laughs> Do you remember it? Uh, Capilius Sibilius, something like that. <laughs> were, you, were you approving of it or did no, you no, say, no, Christ, I, what's I this? I didn't bother, I didn't. And then there was another nickname when you appeared in Rhinoceros. That's correct. They used to call me Rhinoceros, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I spent, spent, spent most of my time really doing many of the other extracurricular stuff, uh, acting. And then, of course, later I went on to direct plays in the university. I directed plays in St. Stephen's, in Delhi School of Economics, Miranda House, um, Lady Irwin. So the theatrical element in you came out first? Yeah, yeah. So I was always, I always loved theatre. There's a lovely story from that time. I want you to confirm it for me. I gather Brinda Karat was the belle of the university and you became the envy of college because you got to clinch her on stage. Oh, absolutely. She used to sit on my lap because she was a mermaid. <laughs> and it's, uh, you, know, you know, sort of, uh, I had to sort of uh, be very restrained. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you that. Uh, but she's a lovely, lovely lady. Yeah. And she was the belle of the university she at the time? She was the belle of the university, absolutely. And you were the envy of the college because oh, you I got to I sit on what. her lap? <laughs> no, no, she got She to. sat on your she lap? Sat on oh, even better still. That's why I said I had to exercise <laughs> a lot of restraint. <laughs> Now, unlike your dad, Akhil, who was an actor and enjoyed the fun side of college, you did a double major in philosophy. And most of us look on philosophy as a forbidding subject. I take it you took to it like a fish and water. Yeah. Well, I, I was out to do anything other than law. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was exploring every avenue. And philosophy just interested me. I took a few courses and that led to more. And then I decided to major in it along with political science. And... Uh, to be honest, political science, I just threw in there so that it would sound more acceptable to my parents. <laughs> philosophy, not something people see as, a, uh, as something that... Would... No, I was not happy about it. <laughs> you wanted your son to follow in your footsteps? No, 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 not that. I never, I never forced them to do anything. It was their choice. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand where he was going with philosophy. No obvious career. Science. No obvious no career path. Philosophy and I just didn't know where he was so going. So what would you prefer him to do? No, no, it was up to him. But I didn't think that this choice was a very wise one. But, 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 okay. but, but ironically, it's because of philosophy that I decided to do law. 
Because as I told you, being surrounded by law as you grow up, you tend, to, it's possible that you, you know, are a little averse to, to, you know, following the same path that has been followed by your father and grandfather and you try to strike out on an original note. That was what I was thinking when I went to college. Did philosophy, loved it, and at the end of that I thought to myself, well, it's either academia, I know what I like, which is philosophy, or law, which is actually very similar in terms of the methodical, structured thinking, the analytical skills, and so actually, as a result, law became an active choice for me rather than a passive but one. This is fascinating. You took philosophy because you actually didn't want to take up law and then philosophy in a real sense opened you up Absolutely. to the possibility of being a lawyer. So in hindsight, he should be happy that I did <laughs> No, no. See, see, he's the kind of guy, if he were to do law and he didn't like it, he would have dropped it. And so the best way was to not let him do not law yeah, exactly. and he would find his own exactly. calling. Exactly. That's how it now is. he has a lovely story to it. He says one of his early memories of you is when you would visit the family in France and in Egypt and it was very hard to get you out of bed. All you would want to do is sleep, sleep, sleep and they'd have to bully you to get up. Absolutely. So is the real Kapil Sibyl a bit of a lazy song? Absolutely. Without, even now. <laughs> even now when I come back from court and if I can sort of steal half an hour. I sort of, uh, I, you know, I sleep for a while. I can sleep at any time. So am I right in saying Kapil Sibyl's favorite place is bed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, can I embarrass you and ask desk, on your own? On my own. <laughs> <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm not at my desk, I'm in my bed. How amazing. This is really quite an admission. When I'm not at my desk, <laughs> I'm in yeah, my I, bed. I love, I, love, I love to sleep. I love to rest. So having, I, having daddy for a holiday wasn't much fun because instead of taking you around and showing you places and taking you to restaurants, he was asleep in bed. I used to feel bad. I, I felt he must be so tired. <laughs> no, no human could sleep that much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, you see, I'm not an early riser. And they used to get up early and get ready. Why are you late? We have to go this place, that place. And uh, so my, my, you know, I, I love the evenings. I and, I and he used to go and uh, to the Zamalek club. Yeah. Yes, uh, you, I used to play squash there. And we used to take our evening trips uh, in Egypt to, to Zamalek. Not being an early riser and preferring the late nights means that you have all the wrong discipline to be a lawyer and a politician because those guys get up very early and go to sleep pretty early too. I don't know too. which politician gets up early. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I doubt it. <laughs> and do politicians spend their best time in bed? At that, of course, you have to ask them. <laughs> My activity was so low. <laughs> <laughs> now, you said that your dad was younger than his years and you're older than yours. So, does he that still mean. Is, still is. He's a child at heart and you're a bit of an old fogey. I think that's correct. Huh? I think that's correct. But when I you mean, say he still is, what do you mean? Well, he's always been very youthful. Uh, that youthful exuberance, that positivity, that zest for life, it keeps you young. I, on the other hand, a slightly negative personality. So, for me, no, 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 for me, positivity is a little bit of an effort. So, are you times. in a sense polar <laughs> opposites? Because you also have said, and I've read this, that your father is positive in his outlook to life. You're a bit negative. So, the two of you always look at the same thing and come to different conclusions. Well, well, with his positivity is infectious. So, it keeps me positive. But yes, approaches can be a little bit different. I wouldn't say polar opposites, but... But, but a healthy difference of opinion. That's right, that's right. Well, he's, he's very intense. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, very committed to what he does. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not like that. I, I enjoy what I do. You see the he, humor and the joke and everything. He doesn't necessarily enjoy what he does, but he, he's committed to what he does. This is my understanding. It sounds as if you're pushing yourself to do things you don't want that to do. I think, I think so. I, I, mean, I, mean, I think so. I mean, I mean, for example, I mean, if he has a matter, he's obsessed with it. But, uh, you know, at some level, I say, oh, forget it. You can distance yourself distance, from yeah, work. Yeah, yeah I, he, I do that. He's immersed in it. I, I think so. I get more emotionally engaged that's and involved. Right, that's right. And so your work becomes your life? Yes, and, uh, you know, uh, the matter is mine. And I, he can... I, I'm the lawyer, I'm the client, it's, it's personal. You know what happens is he calls, you know, when he does a matter sometimes, he calls me in the evening and he relates, you know, he tells me what happened. And he's, you know, sometimes very disturbed. You know, and if it's MF Hussain, he was representing, he would tell me, uh, you know, this is what happened. That one, he's excited, you know, and he wants to fight for the right causes. Human rights, 
you know, stuff like that. So he's he very gets, liberal in his approach. He gets completely involved completely. in what he's doing yeah. and it becomes and it takes him it's over. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you can switch off and I, get into bed. I, I can switch off. <laughs> I can do other things. I can do other things. Now, you, it's interesting. You once said to the Telegraph that when Akhil was young, you couldn't boss him. He knew his own mind. Yeah, yeah, he knew yeah. exactly what he wanted to do. Yeah. That must have been a bit of a problem because lawyers and politicians like bossing no, people. No, no, no. I never bossed anybody. In fact, even now. You know, cannot boss him. You don't boss him? Uh, no. Shall I ask, ask him whether that's him. true? Never, never, never. Does he boss you? No, not at all. Not Does he try? He's not, he's not interfering. He doesn't, he's never dictated how I should or should not do things. He's let me do what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, the, the difference has been, whereas, for instance, my mother was involved with the nitty gritty. And since I was living with her and he was in India and we were traveling since she was in the foreign service. So he wasn't involved in that sense with the nitty gritty. He knew that, you know, daily affairs were well looked after by my mother. And his concern was what's happening in your mind? What are you thinking? He about? was the big picture man. He was the big picture man. You once said of him that he's never interfered in my life. But the flip side is he didn't get involved either. To me, that sounds like the ideal dad. Let the boy be himself and I'll simply push and nudge when it's needed. Yeah, in, in many ways, yes. Um, at times, I certainly wanted more time with him only because there was a physical distance and in those days, people weren't quite as jet set as they are now. There weren't internets and there weren't phones uh, exactly, and there wasn't Skype. Exactly, exactly. So exactly. there were times when actually you missed not having uh, daddy. I, on a daily basis, yes, I did. But overall, yes, I, 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 there was no, he was never controlling. Uh, and he believed that uh, the general good sense that, uh, you know, my mother had drilled into me would hold me in good stead. And he sort of hoped for the best. <laughs> people are going to find it hard to believe that Kapil Sibyl didn't bully and push his sons. Most people think politicians you know, you do that all the time. You, you must understand my views of the education are based on this. Don't interfere with the kid. Let him grow up. Let him find his own, own genius. And you practice that with your own children I to start with? with my own children. Fascinating. Let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to turn and talk about your careers and the phenomenal success that both of you have had. We'll be back in a moment's time. Stick with us for the second part of this unique conversation with Kapil Sibyl and his son, Akhil Sibyl. Welcome back. You're watching India Today, India Tomorrow. And my guests are Kapil Sibyl and his son, Akhil Sibyl. Let's talk about your careers. Kapil, you began yours teaching history at Hindu College. How did you end up a lawyer? I don't know. I really don't know. Because I, in 1969, I think, I did my MA. And I was walking after giving the university exam. And Bipi Chandra the late Bipin Chandra, who was my professor in the university, is walking behind. And he asked me, what are you going to do, Kapil? I said, sir, I, I, I'll, join, I'll, I, I'll join the faculty. He said, well, why don't you teach? I said, sir, who will give me a job? I was a fairly good student when, you know, <laughs> in university. By then. By by then. then. <laughs> so he said, why? There's a place in Hindu college. Why don't you apply? I said, sir, but I want to do law. When I want to do it in the morning, I, he said, if you get the job, I'm sure they'll adjust it. So I applied, I got the job, they adjusted my classes, right? And at the same time, I sat for the IAS. So in 1972, I had three career options. IAS, academics, yes. and law. And law. Why did you choose law? IAS, I was very upset, actually, uh, because uh, I did I directed a play called Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. And the government of India at that time thought that I was a Naxalite. And, and didn't send me the offer for some time. Still, of course, they ultimately sent it. And that put you off? Put me off. That's number one. You were hurt? I was upset because, you know, I was in theater. And as far as the uh, teaching job is concerned, I, you know, I love teaching, but, uh, you know, my brothers were in the bureaucracy. That's the other reason why I didn't join. My three brothers. Were You're making it seem as if law was an option by default. Yeah, in a, no, but I wanted to do something different. I just did. And my father was very keen that one of us did the law. So eventually you decided, decided I'll do what daddy says. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is it just a coincidence that you become a lawyer? And I know how it happened because not wanting to be a lawyer made you study philosophy and philosophy pushed you back into law. But looking back, is it a coincidence you're a lawyer or do you think it would be inevitable that Kapil's son and your 
grandfather's grandson, because your grandfather was an eminent lawyer, would be a lawyer too? I think given the way that I think my makeup, it was inevitable. If I had been someone else, then perhaps I would have gone in a different direction. But looking back and reflecting over how my mind and my thoughts developed and how my personality developed, I think eventually I, I was meant for law. Do you think it's actually in the genes? Because you're the third generation. It's possible. It's huh? possible. <laughs> now, there's an interesting story. You've embarked as a lawyer on your own. But there was a time right at the beginning when you asked your father for help to try and draft a petition and he said no. And with hindsight, it was probably the best thing because it forced you to work it out on your own. But at the time, when daddy said no, were you taken aback? Yeah, well, I, I uh, adopted a slightly unusual course, which is that when I started out, I didn't join anybody. Typically, even if you come from a legal lineage, you typically join another lawyer, work in somebody else's chamber. And I started out on my own. So I really did need a lot of help and there was not much guidance close at hand. And he wasn't willing to help. And he being 35 years into the profession, it's like you know, he knew how to drive, but he was not clear about how to teach others how to drive. <laughs> so when I went to him and said, look, can you help me draft a petition? He said, well, if you bring me a drafted petition, I can tell you what's wrong. But I don't know how to go about it. So I had to fumble my way through it and figure it out, which was good. Which You're was a bit good. of a hard task master. No, no, you? but you see, you must learn how to swim. See, in life, you but must do be you thrown have to into, throw the him water. into the deep end. I did it myself. I mean, my, my father didn't help me. I came to Delhi. I was a briefless lawyer. A briefless lawyer. I used to go from court to court looking at judges, understanding their psychology finding out what they were, you know, listening to what they were saying, listening to what others were arguing. So if I got a case, <laughs> I'd know how to do it. But I was a briefless guy. Self-taught. And my father, yes, yeah, self-taught. And so the best way to learn how to swim is to be thrown into the water and to struggle. There seems to me as if there's a really tough side to the simple family from your grandfather onwards. Well, well, I, I remember early years and, and still, uh, when I would go to my father with, uh, and still do with the... Uh, self-doubt or something that may have happened in court that I'm not happy with or uh, a misstep by me, uh, hoping that he would recall some missteps that he might have made in his younger years. He can't think of any no mistakes he's ever made. At all. No <laughs> well, I, I never look at the negative things in life at all. Or, or, or you present yourself as a perfect no, no, man. I, I, you know, the, one is bound to make mistakes. But you forget Mistakes them. is part oh, I'll, of life. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. I've, I've gotten to the bottom of it. <laughs> Um, he, I think, uh, if and when he does make a mistake, he forgets about it as quickly as he does, whereas the rest of us pour, pour over it, think about it, analyze it, reflect over it, and, and agonize over what we've done wrong. He recognizes this has happens, happened and moves on. So that's probably very wise because, you know, you've been the lawyer for some of the most eminent politicians in the country, and then also for some of the most eminent actors from Bollywood. I mean, I gather you've represented Narsimha Rao, right. Lalu Yadav, yeah. uh, you've represented Mayavati yeah. and Jai Ralitha, and we all know about how you've represented Salman Khan and Sanjay Dutt. Yeah. Is it daunting and challenging when you're representing celebrities, or is it more difficult when an ordinary man is in your hands? Karan, let me tell you something from the heart. I love representing people who nobody represents. So ordinary people rather yes, than celebrities? I love, I love, that's the best. So then Yesterday, for example, the matter that I did, you know, I, there's no question of charging anything. This is an ordinary Kashmiri that you were doing? It's an ordinary Kashmiri that I was doing. I love doing that. Tista, for example. And I put my heart into those matters. Because so, you were fighting for a cause. See, you're not fighting for winning, a, you know, one case. You're, you're fighting for winning a cause. And that's far more challenging and far more rewarding. So when and you if you don't to, take money, it's even more rewarding. So when you have to represent former prime ministers or former chief ministers or big Bollywood stars, you do it, but it's not your first choice. It's not my first choice. It's not my first choice. People say that the greatest triumph that actually established Kapil Sibyl as a lawyer was the Ramaswamy case. Right. When you had to save a Supreme Court judge from impeachment, would you accept that that was your biggest triumph? Without any doubt. Without any. It was an opportunity that I don't think any lawyer has got in the history of the world. And the great moment was when you had to address Parliament. That's right. Not many lawyers anywhere in the world have done that. Yes. Were yes. you nervous? I was. I was nervous. I was nervous. Why? Because I was, I'll tell that story when I write my autobiography. I was threatened. Uh, Physically? No, 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 no. 
I was threatened in the sense that if you, if you don't, if your client doesn't do this, this will happen. And they, you know, before the hearing, they would come and say, we'll vote against you, we'll finish you, something like that. And I presume you were also nervous because you knew that if you fumbled, yeah. the judge would probably end up impeached. Absolutely. His future depended yes. upon your and, performance. And remember, I did it all free. I spent my own money. I didn't take any fees from Which means failure would have been doubly expensive. Yes, you'd have been absolutely. broke and absolutely. you'd have been a because loser. How, how, could you, how could you ask the judge? Your first case, Akhil, was against the Bar Council of India. Well, that's a very unusual client to have to come up against. It's a daunting initiation into the profession, isn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I'd just come back. I was raring to go. And I was told that for the first time ever, um, there's a policy that you have to give an exam. Uh, even if your degree is recognized. Uh, you know, I was still finding my feet. I was a bit intimidated by the prospect of, at the prospect of being back after 13 years of living abroad and starting in the profession. So I approached it with an open mind, uh, with humility. And, but when I went deeper into it, I was told I had to sit for six papers in two months without a syllabus, with no courses and no guidance. So I said, well, how do you expect me to pass this exam? And I was told that I should just go to the market, get the leading textbook on any giving, given subject and memorize it. I then decided to file a case. And one. And one. The other interesting thing about lawyers is you get to know your clients in a way that even the clients don't realize they're revealing themselves. One of your big clients was M.F. Hussain and you discovered that he wasn't very good at giving tips as a result of which you'd sometimes be kept waiting for 30 minutes and 45 minutes before you got a table at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's absolutely And I was, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't, I couldn't understand how uh, a gentleman with the kind of recognition that he had and with the people, with people milling about him and, and going up to him was kept waiting for as long as he was kept waiting. Until you discovered Until he I doesn't tip. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And absolutely. this is the revenge of the waiter. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, Kapil, lawyers are great with speeches and they're terrific at marshalling facts and arguments. Does that mean lawyers are showmen? Is there well, a Perry you know, Mason in everyone? Uh, well, I, yeah, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. You've got to master your facts. You have to actually outdo the other guy. You have to convince the judge who is not ready to be convinced. So you have to, you have to marshal all your faculties. Outdoing the other guy is the competitiveness that's inherent it's in law. Inherent, it's yeah. an adversarial system. An, yeah, and, 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 and also, if you have theatrical and, and, ability like he does, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> so he, he is performing when he's in court. That's huh? not true. That's not true. That's does, not does, true. A, does the actor, remember, the Capelius Sibelius come out? Remember, when you are acting, you are mouthing somebody else's words. When you are in a court of law, you are actually speaking from your heart if you want to really represent your client. Assuming you have a heart. No, you do. You, do. <laughs> you can't otherwise win cases if you don't have a heart. Let me put it like this. When you're in front of a judge, what is more important? The strength of the argument or the panache with which you present it? the debonair confidence with which you try and win over? Which is more important? Well, I, I think that, I mean, generally the finest um, legal minds are, are not necessarily the best arguing counsel because we're in the business of persuasion and, and our system being the way that it is, um, you know, we have to, you have to be very tactical. You have to understand the personality and nature of the judge and, and speak to that. Uh, if you if you if you have a sense that the judge has a big ego, and you do have to be careful about that and pander to it, pander to it. So at not times. just a good performer, a good lawyer has to be intuitive of yeah. the personality that he's performing in front of what and you said, modulate himself. What you said is most important: intuitive, intuition, is the heart of good lawyering. Lawyers have to have a sixth sense. Yes, he must because why? The lawyer uh, must know the judge. Different judges have different sort of idiosyncrasies. You have to cater to them. Now, this is very interesting. At the very height of your success as a lawyer, you suddenly switched and became a politician instead. Was that ambition to be a politician always lurking inside yeah, you? Yeah, it was. Actually, I remember as a kid, maybe 9, 10, 11, 12, I went to parliament, like kids go now. And I was up there watching uh, a Kashmiri speak uh, in, the, in, in Lok Sabha. And I said to myself as a kid that I want to be there one day. 
Ambition was born at the age of eight. It, it was my desire to be at the center of things. And remember, he was uh, president of the Supreme Court Bar Association three times, which is no small feat in and of itself. So even before he took the plunge. I can tell you it's more difficult to be a president of the Supreme Court Bar than to win a Lok Sabha election. <laughs> <laughs> As the son of a politician, are you attracted to politics at all? Or do you share the general disdain Indians have of politicians and Tutu Meme politics? I am attracted to it, but I'm, I'm not uh, sure that I would want to go into it um, precisely because of the way our system is structured and, and it doesn't necessarily invite uh, people of talent and, and it's not based so on merit. So these are daddy's footsteps you're definitely not going to work No, in. no, no. I think if he gets into politics, and he should, because he has a talent for it. Are you pushing him? No, I'm not pushing him. Are you encouraging him? No, no, no. Not even I think he has a talent for it because I watch him, because the only time my kids were with me was during election time. When I was in government, they never ever, hardly ever visited me. They didn't know where my offices so were. So did you go camp they, campaigning with yes, Daddy? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. He, yes, he campaigned for me, and I know he has the talent to be a very, very successful politician. But of course, it's his choice. As of now, I'm, I'm focused on my legal career, so I have no immediate thoughts. The lovely see. word is now. As <laughs> of now, you've left a little window open for the future. Never say never, never Absolutely. say never. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, couple, they say there's a lot of similarity between lawyers and politicians. They defend the indefensible. They're very good at deceiving people. And they usually end up stinking rich. Am I being unfair? <laughs> no, no, not. <laughs> no, no. You know, sometimes you have to defend the indefensible because you're paid to do so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Even better still, yeah. you make money but out of it. Sometimes you also defend the defensible. And Even then, though you're not paid to do so. And then you're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're a winner. You're a winner. That's where the pleasure but is. But ultimately, ultimately, I think for those um, who are passionate about the legal profession, uh, the real sort of reward is, as my father was saying, the individual impoverished client who has nobody to defend him or her. And the gratitude and, and uh, you know, the lifelong sort of gratitude that you get, whether you win the case or not. That's simply, when, that's when that's lawyers real... feel like Robin Hood. <laughs> yes, they yeah. my, during my election time, I used to go to places and people used to come, why you come here? Because, you know, you defended us, you charged no money. And these were, you know, people who were in services. And I never charged even as a high court lawyer. And they said, you don't have, you don't have to come. These are the touching sides of a lawyer's life that one never gets to know. Let's take a break. And when I come back, I want to turn to another dimension of Kapil Sibyl that the world hasn't seen quite fully. The poet, the lyricist, what I call the fun side <laughs> of Kapil Sibyl. We'll be back in a moment's time for the last part of this unique interview. See you in a moment's time. Welcome back. You're watching India Today, India Tomorrow. My guests are Kapil Sibyl and his son, Akhil Sibyl. Let's come to the fun side of you. Kapil, the world knows you as a lawyer, as a politician, but you're also a poet and a lyricist. And I gather Kush Wan Singh played a critical role in convincing Rodi Books to publish your first collection. That's correct. I went to Kushwant and um, so a friend of ours took me to Kushwant. And, uh, you know, I said, you have written this stuff. He said, let's hear it. And so I started reciting. And, and at the end of it, he said, you must publish. And I said, well, who's going to publish? He said, we'll have Penguin publish. And then Roly Books Kapoor was sitting there. And uh, he, 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 uh, he said, no, no, Penguin Books will take too long. These guys are too, you know, it, it takes time for them to publish. It'll only be published two years from now. So why don't you ask Roly to publish? And he happened to be there. So Roly said, okay, I'll look at it. He went back and he said, let's do it. So a magnificent accident in short yeah, that you got published and yeah. published quickly. Yes, absolutely. But the other amazing thing about your poetry is that it's actually composed on a phone. Yes. And most of it is written during long plane journeys. Absolutely. Well, I have had no time as a lawyer to write poetry. You know, when you, you're so, so involved in the law or as a politician. So when I used to take these long trips to the U.S., uh, you know, or other, other, you know, trips to Bombay or uh, Mumbai or something like that, then I used to write it on my, uh, I, you know, phone. 
But you know, most of us get on a plane and either fall asleep or sometimes get drunk. Right. You bring out your phone <laughs> and your muse takes over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, you, what to do? You have nothing to do for two, two and a half hours or for 12 hours. So boredom is your inspiration? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you really mean it? I mean it. You I were mean just it. filling in time. Yeah, I was filling in time and then I suddenly realized I was enjoying it. So it became a habit it and became, then a hobby. And then I loved it. Then I loved it. And of course, I write in meter. Absolutely. In fact, Akhil, one of the most striking things about your father's poetry is the clear and obvious rhyme and the bouncy meter. One of my favorites is a poem called Political Opportunism. And here it goes. A somersault is a turnabout with acrobatic skills. For those who watch admiringly, it does not cease to thrill. And every time I read it, I say to myself, that reminds me of Lewis Carroll's Old Father William. Absolutely. But I, I remember, I mean, he always, always had a, a talent for poetry and much before he was published, he would, uh, he would be, he, he would pen something clever down all the time about, uh, you know, some, generally about world leaders, <laughs> <laughs> something comical, something amusing. So I think it was something which was in the making. And so as a child, as you were growing up, you and your brother were witness to the poet lurking inside, the lawyer lurking inside the politician. Yes. <laughs> and he used to recite to us as, as well and we used to love it because he had wonderful So daddy is a bit like those Russian dolls. Each time you take one apart, a new one comes, <laughs> right? You take <laughs> the actor, Matryoshka. then comes I, the I lawyer, then comes the politician and eventually many the years, poet. Many I used to read to them a lot of things in bed. That's the other, the other, sometimes I used to spend in bed reading to them. But the interesting thing is that you've written on a range of potentially unpoetic subjects. You've written on POTA, yes. on the 123 Agreement, yes. political sycophancy, right. and you've even written on Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Absolutely. Is this the politician in you finding poetic experience? Yeah, absolutely. Experience? You know, these, are, these are very significant events, so to say, in a nation's life, and nobody has put them to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> So I decided to do it. It was a great one. Akhil, it's not just your father who's a writer. Your mother and your mother-in-law were accomplished writers as well. Would you ever consider writing yourself? I, I wish I had the talent. I haven't found it yet. I haven't found it yet. I mean, you're <laughs> waiting for a plane ride when your muse will speak to you. <laughs> the, 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 yes. Well, I, you know, the, the, the best that I've done so far is, is I have a five-year-old daughter and I've now for about two years been penning down, you know, short verses on conversations with her which which are which are popular amongst my friends but it's that's, very popular that's about all that's about so all. there is a poet lurking uh, inside I him i think so i think so he just simply needs the encouragement to make it he public he needs to have that self confidence you know that he needs to believe in the fact that he can actually do it i never believed in it till 5 7 years ago until kushwant introduced oh, yeah, you to exactly. promote kapoor <laughs> exactly he should have somebody like kushwant <laughs> isn't this a moment when in fact daddy could play a positive role hopefully hopefully in time to come <laughs> now recently kapoor you've moved from writing poetry on your phone to doing lyrics for hindi movies and you've even done songs for ar rahman's rona is it more fun to write for a film song than it is to do conventional poetry? Yeah, I think so. Why? What's the difference? First of all, uh, what you can express in Hindi or Hindustani, I would put it, because I, I'm not, you know, I don't know classical Hindi, in Hindustani is far more effective than in the English language. Why? Somehow, the words are far more evo evocative. The thoughts are... I, you mean Hindustani lends itself to yeah. more evocative poetry yeah, than so. English. I think so. Even though English has Shakespeare and the sonnets I, I, I think and so. Wordsworth, I, I, Keats, I, I Byron. I think so. I think so. I think so. I may be wrong. So, Kapil's muse is a Hindi muse. Yes. Hindustani muse. Hindustani muse. Now, when you write for a film song, mm. do the lyrics come first and is the melody composed to the lyrics or are you given a melody and asked to write it's, lyrics it's to the It's happened both tune? ways. In the latest movie, Shorgul, mm -hmm in which I've written all the lyrics. Uh, the, the, the theme song, Tere Bina, the, 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 the meter was given to me. The meter? Uh -huh. And therefore, I had to, that I, discipline uh, was yeah. one you had to accept? Yes, and How? it's happened before also. But there are many songs of mine which are not in the public domain, for which have been sung by very many you know, prominent singers like Hari Haran and, 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 and Arichit and many others where, of course, I've written the song and they put it to music. So why aren't these in the, the public lyrics. domain? Uh, 
Well, we, by and by. So I get the feeling that there's a couple simple album that's being put together. No, not just an album. I'm looking for some big movies in which you can put those. So the songs are ready and written. Right. And the movie now the has to be found. The music is also complete. And the movie has to be found. That's right. So there's a message here to Bombay directors <laughs> that there's some wonderful songs ready. The music is ready. Yeah. Just come up with the film. Yeah, and there are many people, many of the of the of the uh, musicians and and music directors who've already met me, and and they like them very much. This sounds as if there's a third career that's about to break on the world. You've been a politician, you've been a lawyer, yeah. you seem to be ready to be a no, full-time lyricist. I do for fun and entertainment. Again, I, you know, I, you know, some of the songs I gave in this film, I didn't charge anything. I don't do it for money. When you read your father's poetry or when you listen to the lyrics that he's written for film songs, do they reveal things about him that you perhaps weren't fully aware of? Or is he too much of a politician to ever let down his guard? No, it, I mean, it, as I said, that uh, I think this was always something in the making. I've seen flashes of it growing up, bits and pieces, but he never had the time uh, or he never found the time. And now he has. But of course, I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of emotion behind the words, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it does, it, does he it, at it, times, it, it offers insight. Does he at times express himself through poetry uh, and you through the poetry realize this is a deeply felt emotion rather than conversationally? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I understand him intuitively uh, in any case, but yes, this is an expression. Of, of that which I know. Now there's another side of you, Kapil, not just the poet, not just the lawyer, not just the politician. Kapil Sibir is also a cook yeah. and you enjoy cooking. I love cooking. Cooking only or eating as well? Both, <laughs> both, both. I love, I love food. What sort of cooking do you like? Any, all, all kinds of, all cuisines in the world. So you dabble in whatever you can? Yeah, yeah. All From cuisine. Chinese to French? Chinese to French to Italian. To, to Lebanese. So when you're not in bed, you're in the kitchen? No, no, no. Of late, I'm, <laughs> of late I really had had no time. But yes, uh, you know, two, three years ago, I used to. I used to cook a meal. Is he a good cook? <laughs> or are you too polite no, don't, to don't, say don't, no? Don't, don't, put, don't put him on a, in a spot. Don't put him in a spot. Yeah, you're getting a bit worried that he might be honest. Go on, Akhil. Is daddy a good he's, cook? He's, he's... Or do you grit your teeth and eat what he's making? He's a... <laughs> he... he he enjoys the process so much <laughs> that you can't <laughs> say you can't say it's bad <laughs> that we no it's it's good he's, what he a, is good what a diplomatic he answer he enjoys the process so much we can't say we don't <laughs> no he is he is good at it he is good at it and you know be, because he's so enthusiastic and passionate and he's creative with it he's creative he'll he'll give it uh, you know a, some I don't go by the book a slightly at all yeah. so if you see him in the kitchen There'll be no cookbook. It'll be on instinct. Yeah, I don't go by the book. And is he a clean cook or does he mess up the place when he's finished? Well, he gets somebody else to do all the chopping <laughs> and the cutting. <laughs> he's so a he's, chef. He's like he's a, a fine chef, French a chef. He yeah, just I'm puts sure. it all I'm together. Sure. I'm, <laughs> sure. I'm, sure. Huh? I'm sure. You know, Kapil, as you look back on your amazing career, you've been a top politician, a leading lawyer, and now you're fast becoming a well-known poet. Which of the three is the most satisfying for you? I, you know, I never look at life that way. I, I, I enjoy 100% whatever, whatever, do, whatever I do and I give it 100%. I think he, he thinks about tomorrow, never yesterday. I never think about yesterday. Never in my life have I thought about yesterday. So literally, when one door closes, you walk through the yeah, next absolutely. and that is over. Absolutely. absolutely. It's over. When a musician walks into my room, the other day, two of them came and, you know, then I forget law. Then, then I, you know, I'm involved in that particular. And, and I think the other part that's unique, and which is why I said earlier on that he's far more youthful than I am, is that as one grows older, you see it in others, people become set in their ways. They become uh, averse to, to opportunity and to trying something new. But never him, never him, never him. Well, you couldn't get a better compliment from your son, Kapil. But I'm going to end by asking you, to give the audience a flavor of your poetry, we know Kapil Sibyl the politician, we know Kapil the lawyer, we've heard tantalizingly about Kapil the poet, but now share with us the poems that you particularly believe are your favorite. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me start with a poem on politics, that is in the context of cricket. Very interesting. One day a beloved leader had a disturbing dream. 
was called upon to play for the Indian cricket team. Knowing that he could not bat, his bowling underhand, why selectors took a chance he could not understand. All his attributes he felt unsuited to the game. That was indeed the reason none objected to his name. Did not believe in fair play, and if the game looked lost, was prone to tamper with the ball must win at any cost. Infiltrate the opposite camp to work behind the scenes, reach out for their key players, adopt unsavory means. Expressed his, express his no confidence, appealed on every ball, did all he could to influence the third umpire's call. Incredible, you really are quite a poet and such, the meter is bouncy. Such leaders are of a rare breed, we value not their worth, must look out for technologies to help us cite them at birth. That's a lovely poem. Read another one for us. A love poem this time. Uh, will you tell us who you've got in mind? You'll find out. <laughs> okay. Gentle snowflakes whisper to me, like wayward minds have lost their way. The eerie stillness of winter nights bear witness to their carefree flights. They sway in silence and adjust with ease, caress contours that no one sees. Merge as they fall with comfort lie, their journey is a lullaby. I want you by my side, adrift. You are for me sweet nature's gift. Wayward are ways an antidote where distance time is kept afloat. This fulsome lap allows me to, in nature's womb, get close to you. And as we sink within our world, like snowflakes lost, yet closely curled. What a lovely metaphor, like snowflakes lost. lost. We've got time, I think, for one last one. Okay, so then this is about journalism, politicians, and lawyers. This is not a poem, but it's defining moments. A good judge is one who hears everybody, but listens only to his conscience. A good lawyer is one who rejects the unconscionable, doubts the improbable, respects the probable, projects the reasonable. A good journalist is one who rejects the reasonable, suspects the probable, embraces the improbable, investigates the unconscionable. And I can see and you don't like journalists. A successful politician is one who makes the unconscionable sound reasonable and the reasonable sound unconscionable. <laughs> <laughs> Kapil Sibyl, those are magical moments. My thanks to both of you for joining me today. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.